Welcome to the Mind and Club Theology Podcast, hosted by Miriam Keith and Amy Panton, which come out of the Canadian Journal of Theology, Mental Health, and Disability. We both live and work on lands that have been homes and remain homes to the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Neutral, and the Ojibwe Chippewa peoples and other peoples who have cared for the land. We are grateful for the opportunity to live and work on this land and are mindful of the need to repair broken covenants. This podcast is an opportunity to model how faith communities can engage in theological and spiritual conversations around madness and cryptness. If you need a full transcript, you can find our videos on our YouTube channel. We want to say before we begin that topics and conversations we are raising throughout our time together are often hard. They are hard for mad and quick people ourselves and hard for our families and loved ones. So do what you need to do to take care of yourselves, your bodies, minds, and hearts. And now, here is our episode. So, welcome to the fourth episode of the Mad and Crypt Theology podcast. It is so nice to be here with you all again. And today we have Alex Jebson and Laura McGregor joining us. Miriam and I are so happy to be able to talk to both of you. Um, what I'm going to ask both of you to do is just introduce yourselves. And I'm going to put uh, just in the chat here, because we're on Zoom, um, what we're hoping you could let our listeners know. So just your name, your pronouns, your work, or your academic location, wherever you might be finding yourself right now, your connection to mental health or disability, and then the connection to the journal. So how do we all know each other? So that would be great. And if you might add a visual description of yourself, that'd be awesome. So how about we start with Alex? Um, all right. Thank you so much for having me, Miriam and Amy. It's uh, great to be a part of this. Uh, so I am Alex Jebson, he, him. Uh, I am a candidate for ordained ministry in the United Church, and I am also an MDiv graduate from Emmanuel College in Toronto. I graduated in spring of 2020, and I'm currently doing my supervised ministry education, which um, fancy word for an internship, uh, doing that at Blythe and Brussels United Churches in Huron County here in southwestern Ontario. Um, in terms of connection to mental health and disability, I'm learning. I'm still a student. I'm still uh, learning how to be a good ally to these communities. Um, my own connection to mental health is uh, I've uh, diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder in my university career. So that's um, the mental health perspective that I bring to my ministry in my daily life. Um, uh, connection to the journal here, I was very lucky to um, be in classes with Miriam and Amy, uh, both as colleagues and as uh, them being my TA. So um, I feel a little bit like the small fry here, but I'm, <laughs> I'm very excited to be here uh, nonetheless. So was that everything, I think? And this, this five what oh, the visual you're wearing and yeah um on your hair. <laughs> it's the the pandemic hair is real um 
Yeah. If the humidity goes on for two more days, I'm getting a perm. So. <laughs> um yeah that's amazing i know uh, can you um, i was who you are sure um first of all thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this conversation i'm really excited to be here and looking forward to the chat i'm laura mcgregor um, my pronouns are she her and I'm an associate professional faculty at Martin Luther University College, which is part of Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario. My connection to disability feels long and complicated. Mm -hmm. um, I started my professional life as an occupational therapist, so I worked with people with disabilities. And then um, my second of three boys, three sons, was born with significant physical and intellectual disabilities and was fairly medically complicated throughout his life. So um, after being a professional working with people with disabilities, I became a mother and a caregiver to a very complex child. And that really um, brought me to the disability and theology world. My connection to the journal, I've known, I'm, I feel very fortunate to have known Miriam for many, many years. She uh, and I met at Five Oaks Family Camp where she would beat us all at cards. Um, <laughs> I was introduced to Amy through Miriam. And when I learned about this journal, I was so excited. I, it, it is such an important contribution to the conversation and to the work in Canada. And I'm thrilled to be a small part of the conversation. In terms of a visual description, um, imagine a middle-aged mother slash woman with gray blonde hair that is also COVID length, so it's now permanently living in a ponytail. And I wear blue glasses and I'm wearing a blue t-shirt. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm, yeah, I'm more COVID hair that eventually I'm going to shave it off, I think. Um, and I am wearing a blue and white type dress and purple glasses. And I'm Amy, and I also have COVID hair. Uh, and a lot of like curly hair today because of the humidity. I don't really know what happened. Uh, I also have big nerd glasses on and I'm wearing a David Bowie t-shirt. So, yes. Oh God. Yes. So we wanted to, um, before we started today, we wanted to just give a little content warning here because some of the conversations that we're gonna be getting into today are going to be, they're going to be real. Um, we're going to be talking about suicide. And also we'll probably navigate some of the territory around grief and also the death of children. So we just want you to, to know that in advance. And um, we want you to take care of yourself as you're listening. So this first question is, is directed to Nora's work. Um, we're forbidden on preamble about my work. So I never saw myself pursuing PhD studies. Never wanted to do it, but when I started to see myself as disabled, as a disabled or quite queer woman, I realized that most of disability theology was written by white able-bodied, able-minded men promoting belonging almost over and above with 
interest in diversity and power imbalances. Of course, I am hugely indebted to their work, and I'm engaging their work in a critical way that I know one day someone else will engage my work in a similar way. It struck me, Laura, how you named the colonization of stories and the colonization of disabled bodies and minds through the white male gaze. So my little tiny question is how do we challenge the message of belonging and inclusion that we claim the importance of disabled minds and bodies. Like you have done beautifully in your work and recognize that there must be reversals in how we understand and experience power in churches. That's a heavy one. So just bite off as much as you want. Okay. Yeah, tall order there, Miriam. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I think when I, I read that question, when you sent it to me in advance of today's conversation, my knee-jerk reaction was, how do we respond to voices that have dominated the conversation? So as you point out, often white, male, able-bodied, and intellectually able voices. And I think my first thought was, the work you're doing. This journal in particular, I think, is contributing a really important collection of voices to the conversation because you're disrupting who is part of the conversation. So in addition to the very traditional scholarly research article, you're asking people to reflect or to speak to the lived experience or to bring art or sermons or poetry that reflect the lived experience. And I have found that very refreshing. I know as a PhD student and now as I'm navigating these first few years post PhD, one of the things I really struggled with was that the conversation, particularly around intellectual disability was dominated by not only intellectual academics, but hyper-intellectual academics. And similarly, worship was equally dominated by this hyper-intellectualism. And I know I spent a lot of time thinking about that as a mother and as a mother of a child with significant intellectual disabilities, particularly when it came to worship, which was what I've written about with this journal, is I spent time thinking about how my son Matthew might have engaged worship and how worship would speak to him or not as someone who understood the, wor the world not with ideas and words, but with his body. And so I think the work you're doing where you're creating space for people to talk about these, these things in a way that steps outside sometimes of the particular very specific academic way of discussing ideas is an extremely important and disruptive way of approaching who gets to talk about what in the conversations around disability and worship and caregiving and theology. So really my, my, my sort of first thought when this question was posed was well, exactly what you're doing in this journal um, 
by intentionally creating spaces for, for new conversations. Wow, thank you. And I, um, I want to ask the follow up. Um, I want you to talk a bit about your piece. I can tell we just have what it maybe even two or three times, but for we just who haven't picked it up yet. Um, can you tell us about about how you use those ideas and relation to worship and this in your work. Yeah, so the piece I wrote for this journal really started from my own lived experience, my own reflections as Matthew's mother and as trying to find a about trying to find a place for us in worship, and in part, the fact that we left worship for many years. Matthew uh, was nonverbal and really experienced his spiritual life through his body. And the traditional worship in many mainstream Canadian churches, certainly the United Church where I spend time, was very intellectual in its approach. And so my article was was beginning to think through what would worship look like if we spent a bit more time in our bodies. Um, it also critiqued some writers who were commenting on intellectual disability and faith, and in particular suggesting that people with intellectual disabilities experienced a more passive relationship with God. And I really took exception to that. I did not believe my son simply passively received, a, a passively experienced a relationship with God. I believed he had an active role in it. And just because he couldn't describe it in words or it wasn't a relationship that was captured in ideas, didn't make it any less valuable or any less powerful or any less active. But yet I comment on the fact that, that some scholars would suggest that it was a more passive relationship. So I was trying to come at it from two angles, One, thinking about um, critiquing some of these arguments that suggested that people with intellectual disabilities were passive recipients of, of a relationship with God and didn't actively engage in it. And then also trying to think through through sort of this lens of my son's experience that I believed I had access to as his mother, what, what would an embodied relationship with God look like? And Matthew possibly experienced that. And then more importantly, how could we all experience that? And how could we learn from the wisdom and leadership of my son and people with intellectual disabilities? And rather than suggesting their faith was childish and passive, step back and say, well, maybe all of us would benefit from a more embodied relationship with the divine or a more holistic relationship with God and trying to think through that. So the, the article is an opportunity for me to play with those ideas. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, Alex, I'm going to ask you a question now about your paper. So I'm wondering if you could just give our listeners um, a little bit of a summary of the paper, if they haven't had a chance to read it yet. And maybe you could also um, just let our listeners know about the class that you were in when you wrote it. I think that might be interesting for them. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Amy. So um, yeah, this uh, paper was originally one that I wrote for um, a class entitled Suffering and Hope, which I took in my final year at Emmanuel. And it was, um, of course, based around suffering and hope, looking uh, through different uh, religious lens and social science lens around how people experience suffering and grief and where 
meaning and hope is found in the midst of that. And so um, this paper here, kind of the, the focus was taking two different uh, lens and applying it to a pastoral situation around suffering. Um, so the topic that I, uh, that I took on was um, student suicides at particularly at the University of Toronto, which Emmanuel College is a, is a part of. Um, I, what really sparked it was uh, an incident in January 2019 when there was a suicide on campus and me and another uh, seminarian happened to be in the building when the chaplain at that college um, was trying to set up a space and um, a place for grieving and and um, and and discerning. Um, and so being asked to be a non-anxious presence that evening kind of sparked uh, this paper. The approaches that I took were a, a Christian approach as a as a, as a student minister, as well as more of a secular social sciences approach, because that might be language that many university students would be a bit more uh, familiar with. And it's more of a general survey about some different aspects of suffering and where the kernels of hope might be. So for uh, the uh, secular uh, portion of it, looking at the sources of suffering and external trauma of you know, severed relationship and disruption of the norm of um, progress, kind of that gone too soon um, mentality. And particularly a perceived lack of agency uh, when compared to an institutional response. There was quite a lot of uproar for many months uh, between the student body and the uh, and the University of Toronto governance around their uh, handling the, the suicides that had taken place that year. Um, Christian suffering, uh, that lens was more focused on, you know, worries about isolation from community. I played around a bit with uh, Kenneth Pargaman's concept of small gods, where the faith that, the faith upbringing that some university students might have brought to them to, um, to university, it might not necessarily be fleshed out enough or deep enough to handle this type of crisis, um, as well as a, a divine struggle of sorts and potential worries about um, a theological conflict with, um, uh, with some people not necessarily share, sharing the same ideas of Christian suffering. Uh, where I delved into the kernels of hope was around agency and justice seeking and validation of being able to use our words and use a collective narrative of sorts to, um, to go through a process of meaning discerning um, where there's a uh, yeah, we're just being able to acknowledge what has happened and being able to uh, have resources to kind of put to words what the experiences are. It's, it's probably one of the most fundamental healing things in itself in this type of situation. Um, the last part of the article, I focused more on exploring how Christian liturgy might be able to play into, uh, into this healing process. Um, because this paper was written in the spring of 2020, I didn't, uh, I couldn't quite write a whole grief liturgy from scratch because the world was kind of dealing with other things at the time. But uh, what I drew from was a longest night service, which is found in many uh, traditions within the Christian stream around grief and lament and drawing from scriptural resources, drawing from um, embodied actions of laying our grief down and collecting our grief together. Um, and yeah, so it's it's just generally a very basic survey, but um, something that I've been exploring more deeply as I've been going into congregational ministry and 
hope to draw from more and more as time goes on. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, it was, um, it's such a timely paper, very, very timely. We were so happy that we could include it uh, for our readers. So I wanna ask you um, a little bit about the scriptures that you decided to incorporate into the paper. So um, you said that, uh, sorry, would you be able to talk about what drew you to the scriptures that you incorporated uh, in relation to the experience of a community bearing witness to suicides? So Miriam and I were really interested in, um, given the entire Bible and how big it is, why did you choose the, the scriptures that you chose? Yeah, there's, there's a lot to pick from, isn't there? <laughs> yes. Um, I think the, when I was looking for scriptural resources, the first thing I was looking for is where are the cries of grief and pain? Where is the, where is kind of that guttural um, initial reaction? And for that, I found that in the book of Lamentations, which pretty much every time I brought up the book of Lamentations, people go, huh? Like they, they've just never heard of it. And yet lament and particularly the book of Lamentations is such a deep, rich part of our um, religious tradition. Um, I mean, even just the first, I, I can't think of the Lamentations 3, the, the thought of my affliction and my homelessness is wormwood and gall, like very heavy language, very like gets right to the point. And there's some agency in being able to express that language. And, or if you're feeling that you don't have the words, there are words, I don't want to say provided for you, but to inspire you to, to express your own uh, grief and concerns over it. Um, the other thing that I really appreciate about the Book of Lamentations is that it does provide the words of hope in there, but it isn't a clear trajectory. Uh, Lamentations is only about four or five chapters long, but each chapter begins with the lament and then goes into the petition, and then it has those kernels of hope. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, God's mercies never come to an end. But then we go back into the lament, then we go back into the emotions because, and from a different perspective each time, whether it's lamenting as an individual, as a community, as an entire nation, it's, uh, it provides a bit of that um, repetitive or cyclical nature of time that I think we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, the other passage that I can think of right now that, um, I really dwelled on for a bit was the passage coming from the gospel of John with the death of Lazarus and Jesus going uh, to visit Mary and Martha, Lazarus's sisters. Um, a couple things that I found related to um, the experience of the student suicides and where the hope might be, where the kernels of hope might be is, you know, uh, Jesus wept, the shortest verse in the Bible one of the most impactful, one of the thing, one of the verses that most shapes my pastoral ministry, a God who is, uh, who abides with us, who laments and feels with us and bears witness to a community. There's, this isn't happening in isolation. Uh, people are over at the house. People are going through the, the rituals and the meaning discerning of this. The other thing that really spoke to me was uh, Martha telling Jesus off in this passage, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. There was that little uh, word of agency there, that little bit of uh, justice seeking and meaning discerning that I found in the student body's response to the institution's arguable lack of response, that being able to name name the injustice for what it is, name the worry for what it is. The hopes in the past is there a little bit later, there, there is some resolution there, but the agency and the uh, steadfastness of God during the time of grief. And that kind of, I think, permeates through most of the, most of the scripture that I, that I use for this paper. Thank you so much, Alex. 
I think Miriam has our next question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Alex. And thank you for talking about the depth of scripture and the, the gradual response to grief, which, which brings us to where grief happens. Grief happens in our bodies. That look different depending on cultural personality, but that always happens in our body. And I believe in God's body. So that leads us to our next happy but important question. In the pieces both of you shared, grief and lament were woven through your words. And, and also I enjoy she wrote an essay in disability visibility edited by Alice Wong, and she shared how quick time is similar to, is a part of quick time is brief time. So I will invite Amy to read those words. In arranging grief, Sacred Time and the Body in 19th Century America, Dana Luciano traces how grief time emerged with modernity as a temporal and effective state juxtaposed to progressive mechanical time. She writes that, quote, grief was aligned with a sensibility that sought to provide time with a human dimension, one that would be collective rather than, than productive, repetitive rather than linear, reflective rather than forward moving, unquote. This sounds very much like the notion of crypt time that Allison and Margaret were talking about. But disability scholars like Allison, Margaret, and me tend to celebrate this idea of crypt time, to relish its nonlinear flexibility, to explore its power and its possibilities. What would it mean for us also to do what queer scholar Heather Love calls feeling backward? for us to hold on to that celebration, that new way of being, and yet also allow ourselves to feel the pain of crypt time, its melancholy, its brokenness. Thank you, Amy. So I will invite, invite Nora to speak first, and our question is, <clears throat> So through your theological lens as a mother, where is God in quick brief time? Or make it simple in your mind. Sorry, my friend, you're awesome. You can do this. Wow, you don't hold back, do you, Miriam? <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, where is God in crypt time? I think, I think thinking through this question, um, and I was grateful to get hints of it before today. Um, it's interesting, you know, you talk about grief time and you talk about crypt time, and I think in a lot of the work and writing I've done in recent years, I've been thinking about it as chaos. Um, this idea of that the world expects us to move through our own personal narratives in this linear, organized way and yeah. talk about it as crypt time. It's not a word I would have used, but it made sense to me where it's 
it's circular and it's nonlinear and it's flexible and it, it doesn't follow the narrative trajectory that we often expect in our day-to-day -day lives and that our Western world expects. And I have spent a lot of time thinking and talking and writing about chaos because within my caregiver experience, um, often caregiving theologically is described as a very spiritually transformative moment. And I don't want to suggest that there weren't moments that weren't spiritually transformative, um, but a whole lot of it was just chaos. Mm -hmm. and, and so for me, your description of crypt time or grief time really to me felt like chaos. And then mm -hmm. where is God in that? Where is God in the chaos? Where is God in this experience? And I think my answer um, and my learning through much of the last 22 years has been God is in the, the paradox. God is in this this experience that is simultaneously chaotic and nonlinear and and at times nonsensical um, that is also joyful and redemptive if that makes sense and and and, and, and I think maybe it doesn't make sense and it's not supposed to make sense because yeah. God is in in the paradox and the mystery so I think that's my best attempt to answer this very, very big question. Yeah, and it can take a stab at it. That is a beautiful answer, and I would expect nothing less from both of you. No question on it, but from what were you thinking about as you reflected on this past and finding, finding God. Yeah, my answer is going to be a lot less eloquent. <laughs> um, I mean, the thing that, I mean, this question really made me check myself a little bit because sometimes I lean quite a bit into my Methodist heritage in this idea of uh, spiritual maturation and sanctification where there is this there is this projected growth or some type of progress even if we don't quite clearly understand that and in lived experience and to the lived experience that I've witnessed in others and to the people who I'm serving now like that's that's not how it appears most of the time. It's not necessarily the case. Um, yeah, I think I touched on it before, the kind of cyclical nature of how we experience the divine through our scriptures and through our faith tradition, how there's not necessarily a linear path there um, in the day-to-day. -day. The thing that I dwelled upon was kind of the already not yet that we find in the Holy Spirit and in the inbreaking of uh, the kingdom of God. Um, you know, there's the promise, there's the potential there that's always held for us and always offered. And yet we're, um, and yet we still do experience the grief and the lament and the, and part of being who we are a part of being God's children and beloved creatures. Um, I think the other thing that from uh, the Christian lens that really lends itself to this understanding of crip or grief time is this idea of the collective narrative of being grafted onto the body of Christ. That's the image that popped into my head where um, you're bearing witness to and sharing with the um, with the experiences of others, and uh, not necessarily in a in a colonizing way. And Laura, I thank you for for offering that language and offering that um, understanding of how we relate to to one another's spiritual journeys. But in a way that is um, that can promote some um, reflection and empathy and compassion and. Um, and being able to 
look back on our own journey, look forward into our own journey with new insights every time. So um, yeah, crib and grief time, God's in there in a way that's as convoluted as it seems and more so. <laughs> Thank you so much to both of you. That was a that was a, a tough one. And uh, when I remember when we emailed you, we said the question itself was hurting our brain. So we just thought maybe you would both be able to sh shed some wisdom. So thank you for that. Uh, we wanted to just give you both an opportunity um, to ask each other questions or maybe make some comments to one another about each other's work. Um, so Laura, I might invite you to, to start if there's anything you might want to ask Alex or, or discuss with Alex about his piece. Um, yeah, I think my first, thank you. Um, and, and thanks for your article, Alex. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, I think right now I'll start with a comment. Um, and it, your article in many ways was pastoral, which I was grateful for. Um, so what I haven't shared yet is that you were writing this article during a time when I was in the intensive care unit with my son. My son passed away two weeks into the pandemic. And one of the things you talked about in your article, which really struck a chord with me, was grief transformed to advocacy. Um, and that one of the responses to grief was anger and calling out of the university. And for me, you know, thinking through a little bit of my journey um, after Matthew's death and channeling some of my grief into what I felt was advocacy. So writing some of this stuff around how do we, how do we start to make change around how disabled experiences are included and welcomed in our faith community. So I was, I just want to say how grateful I was for that particular part of your article because it, it really, really spoke to me. Um, I guess one of the things I was curious about was how, as you're in the midst of supporting your classmates and your fellow U of T students in the midst of this overwhelming experience and then you're trying to write about this during COVID <laughs> and the first few weeks of of the world seeming to fall apart how did you navigate this personally how did you attend to your own self-care and your own mental well-being as you're spending all of this time trying to both care for others but then also transform it into advocacy Thank you, Laura. Um, I appreciate the comment and it's a very good question. And <laughs> thinking back now to writing the article, I'm wondering uh, just how much self-care was actually there if, or if it was just kind of written in panic because that's, I mean, sometimes that's just the mindset of the end of semester <laughs> anyways. Um, I do think that for myself, there was self-care in doing the research itself and seeking out the the resources there. Um, from a more pastoral and professional standpoint, just being able to pinpoint where some of the resources were um, gave me a sense of calm and relief compared to uh, being in the initial experience. Um, being asked to dwell in scripture, it's, I, it's something that, I mean, Lectio Divina and those sorts of dwelling in the word type of scripture, that's at the heart of my own, um, I, my own spiritual well-being and spiritual practices. So it was, fortunately for me, it was kind of built in there. As well, I did, um, have support from the community around me, from the student body, from the student body at Emmanuel, um, and uh, the pastoral resources there. Um, 
uh, I'll also give uh, credit to um, uh, Philip, the chaplain at North York General Hospital. When I was writing this article, I was also doing my uh, third year placement at North York doing student chaplaincy. And to his credit, trying to be a chaplain himself in a hospital at the outset of COVID at one of the hospitals where there was the first outbreaks or first patients being cared for there, uh, he was willing to take the time with me and to help me discern through this and stuff. So um, yeah, kind of in the process, being able to dwell in the faith narrative and the stories of others and having those pastoral resources built into, into university life, I think it was, was very helpful for me to, uh, in writing this article, even if I didn't actively seek out those supports as much as I could have at that time, I suppose. Thanks, Alex. And I wonder um, if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to share with Laura. Yes, Laura, again, thank you so much for this work and this article and being able to, um, to offer your own grief and your own insight into, into helping make us some better ministers and some better theologians, really. Um, I think the part that really struck me the most was exploring embodiment in liturgy, because I, I read your article and then I went right back to mine and looked at the liturgy that I had at the end of my article and thinking, oh, we need some more embodiment in there. <laughs> as much as you, um, yeah, it's, it's, it was a bit of a wake up call for me for sure to be able to say, okay, there's a lot of words here, not so much ability to, uh, embody kind of the movement the motion that I was hoping to get through through the service so um I guess my question for you would be in your experience either um in writing this article and afterwards reflecting on the possibilities or in your own experience um uh participating in worship with your son is there one or two kind of embodiment practices or examples that you can think of that really stand out as something that uh, helped you and your son express your uh, active spirituality? Yeah, um, again, great question. I think one of my first thoughts would be, I can only speak to my experience and my experience with Matthew. And so the experiences of other people are gonna be very different, um, potentially. So in terms of bringing embodiment into worship, maybe just attend to the community you're involved in right off the bat. But I think one of the things, again, as I, I, I sort of have talked about, one of the things that Parenting Matthew really brought me to reflect on is, is how, how, how intellectual our faith is. And, and it was only, I, so I stopped attending church for many years because there was this sense that, that there was no place for us and there was no place for Matthew, I think more specifically. And this was really when he was now a teenager and he had outgrown children's programs. But in the worship service, he also really wasn't able to engage and his spirituality wasn't addressed. And unfortunately, then what would happen is he would potentially vocalize. And while people will say it doesn't bother them, there's sometimes some implicit messages that it does. So we would leave. And we would, I think what really started this is that we would often spend our Sundays going for walks and walks in the woods. And so all of a sudden, nature became my church and the experience of being in nature became deeply contemplative and spiritual. And Matthew and I could share in that equally. And our experiences might be different and the way we engaged our faith might have been different, but it was something we could both do. 
and so I think I think bringing people into worship who experience God and experiencing their experience their faith journeys differently I think just being open to that disruption and how we do worship so do we while we're listening to sermons, so some of us still may be engaging an idea, do we also have paints and paper in the sanctuary and people are drawing what they're experiencing? When I, and I'll, I'll share a story that, that brings me to that. When I defended my dissertation, um, it's open so people could attend and a good friend of mine was in the audience and other people were taking notes. She drew my sermon. It was amazing. She, she drew, she's an artist. So, so she drew my dissertation, not my sermon, I apologize. Um, so is that a possibility? Do we have music makers? Do we have open spaces where people can move or sit? Why are we in pews? Like, you know, I kind of want to be radically disruptive because I think only, only by doing that are we going to create the sort of space we need in our worship services where diverse embodiment and diverse ways of connecting with God will be celebrated and honored. And, and I'm only looking at it through my son, but what about people with dementia? What about people with um, hyperactivity disorders? What about people who have sensory disruption? There's many ways of experiencing the world, and, and we don't do a very good job of creating space to welcome them in our worship services. And I, I, and I, I guess I, I love the fact that COVID is asking us to rethink how we worship. And can we continue along with these ideas as we come out of COVID? I would mourn if we immediately go back to the way we always worshiped. And that's, we walk in and we sit in pews and we are quiet and we listen to people. And maybe we sing. Could we do something differently? Um, and, and is COVID the, the turning point, the, the pivot, so that we, we do things differently in a way that that new body, that, that bodies and new embodiment are part of worship. I guess, and I, I, you know, it's more of a reflective response. I don't feel I have any great answers other than be disruptive, be open, look at who's not at worship and ask why. I am in awe of both of you. You are Bernard and I am. We are so blessed by your work. And I feel like we should end this Zoom call with a dance party. Like, we need to do that. Um, you can't. For those on the podcast, go check out the YouTube video right now and see some amazing dance moves. Awesome. Keeping, keeping that dancing spirit Go on and um, the dance met with hope and grief and lament and possibility. We, me and I both, we know our journal is part of its planning. We hope the conversation, but we are very aware that we may end up pushing to the choir, which 
can happen in in theologies that focus on uh, different identities. So I wonder, and no one has the right answer to this. No one has the right answer to anything. You all give beautiful answers. But I'm wondering how do we expand conversations about disability and mental health beyond those with insider knowledge? And does that matter? And secondly, um, Laura introduced us to this question earlier, but I want you to end by naming how you talk to self-care and nurture your own faith while we do this work and this life. You know, this work is part of our life, and our life is part of the work. So, preaching is a choir, and how do we care for ourselves? And I invite Alex to guide us off. Thank you, Miriam. Um, I mean, preaching to the choir as someone who's usually in four or five choirs in non-COVID times, sometimes the choir is the one that needs to be preached to. <laughs> um, yeah, I, when you sent this question ahead of time and I was reflecting on it, I kind of uh, looked at it from a congregational standpoint because that's where I'm serving now. And part of it is just, yeah, using this COVID time to start the conversations or introduce it into the conversations because these conversations about what worship and faith life and and outreach will look like, that conversation is already going on. So like I'm, I'm basically going to just take everything we've discussed here and tell it to the worship committee and the outreach committee <laughs> to everyone, everyone else. Um, I think um, one other thing is, you know, being able to encourage people to, how to train a thought, it was there, <laughs> um, encourage people to be able to relate to this or to be able to have agency and have, and have a voice in this, I'll say, uh, experience in congregational ministry, particularly older rural congregations, they don't necessarily have, they haven't been taught yet the language around these topics. Um, and some ways that uh, it's introduced to them feels a little bit like, okay, we'll check off that box and then move on. Like we had the United Church the first week of May was mental health day, mental health week. And like, that's obviously a great uh, grounding place for a lot of congregations, but how do we move these congregations past that week and past the bell let's talk day and, and stuff like that. Um, so it's just being able to incorporate these conversations into other areas of our lives of faith and, you know, supporting the choir and supporting the outreach and stuff like that too like it's um making people aware of journals like this one and aware of the and aware that there's some preaching going on <laughs> that's yeah so there's not really an answer to that um but just we need to just have more conversations yeah that is a really good answer and Laura, do you want to add? 
Sure, sorry, I had to find my unmute button. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes, thanks, Alex. Um, I think I think we've talked about it off and on over the last hour, but in terms of preaching to the choir, um, stop and take a moment and figure out who's not singing or who isn't entering the building at all um, to be part of the choir and then asking why and then maybe leaving the building and going out and finding them and making space for their stories and their expertise. Um, I, I think we sometimes get really hung up on who has knowledge and who has expertise and we might be really surprised where some wonderful contributions to our faith journeys might begin if we just expanded and disrupted who can be a leader, who can offer wisdom. Um, yeah, so who's not singing and why would be my answer. And then in terms of the self-care piece, because I think that's a really important one as well. I know for me, as I've navigated some of my journey with grief and with chaos, because I really feel that that has been a, a fairly dominant theme in recent years. Um, for me, trying to find some small niche in terms of my own advocacy and my own contribution to the conversation. And I know that that was a, a real struggle for me. After Matthew passed away, I really wondered if I belonged in the conversation anymore, because my entry point was always the mother of a child with disabilities and the caregiver. And if I had lost that role, did I belong in the conversation anymore? And so figuring out how I engage this conversation and how I can contribute and how I can advocate and how I can maybe make space for other women telling stories of caregiving or of supporting people with significant intellectual disabilities. For me, that ended up being a huge part of my self-care during fairly acute grief. And so again, I was very grateful for Alex, um, his highlighting of that, of how that energy can emerge from grief. You said in the been on here. Well, we want to say thank you so much to both of you for taking your time to come and talk to us and also uh, share your stories for our listeners. And we hope we'll be able to have you back on again at some point. Um, Miriam, do you have any closing thoughts that you want to share? You're good? Okay. Well, thank you again so much to Laura and Alex. Thank you both so much. This has been wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed the conversation um, and I've enjoyed meeting you, Alex. Thank you. Same, Laura.